Good evening, everyone. We will get started in about one minute. So hang in there and we'll get started in about one. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Happy Thursday night. It's great to uh, see all of you virtually. Um, I, uh, I hope you're staying warm, depending on what part of the country you're from. If you're from the um, south, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's been a little bit chilly outside. I had um, I had a semi load of uh, woodenware come in uh, from California uh, on Tuesday. And I had to go out and unload it. And I, as a Texan, I thought I was just going to die. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it was so cold. And, and I think it was like, you know, 20, low 20s, mid 20s. And but but, you know, sleeting and icing. Uh, if you're from up north, then you probably think that's absolutely hilarious. Um, but uh, I, I'm definitely not built for this kind of weather. And then uh, today I'm actually in California. So I uh, spent all day um, at the airport uh, Wednesday. I was supposed to have a uh, seven o'clock ish flight um, to California. And I ended up sitting in the airport all day and finally got there late that night uh, because of the weather. But um, but I'm in Central California right now, which I'll be talking about in just a second. I've got some videos for you guys, uh, but I just jumped out of the bee yard here in California to, to do the webinar. And I've got some videos that I filmed uh, really just a couple of minutes ago about what's going on with beekeeping here in California for almond pollination. And uh, and we'll we'll jump into that in just a minute. But let me start our recording real quick so that. Um, you guys can view this later if you would like to. There we go. We have a lot of great things to talk about tonight. And if I haven't met you yet, my name is Blake Shook. And some of you may know me, others may not. I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply. And um, I also uh, am an, own, an owner of Desert Creek Honey, where uh, we raise honeybees and sell them. Uh, we supply all the bees for the Bee Supply. Uh, we are also have a commercial beekeeping operation, a honey packing company, a variety of other things, and uh, we're a, a sister company with uh, the Bee Supply. Um, and so I get to do lots of fun things in, in my job. I get to uh, work bees all day, every day. I get to do education through these webinars uh, and, and a lot of other cool things. So uh, it's always a pleasure to spend Thursday evenings with, with all of you and talk about what's going on in in the beekeeping world so uh real quick housekeeping uh, before we jump into our topics tonight if you have questions put them in the q a box and as always james and sherry are eager and ready to answer any and all questions that have to do with uh, beekeeping and if we have time at the end today we'll do a live q a i feel like i've promised that before and it, we almost never have time <laughs> so if we do have time today we'll kind of do that live q a uh if if we uh get through all of our all of our material. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. If you just want to chat with other beekeepers, then you can use uh, the chat box. So quick, a uh, couple quick things. If you still need bees, uh, we still have bees. So we actually are either just did or will in the next day or so. We just added a ton more dates to our bee pickup. So our we were filling up so quickly. Uh, our, oops. We, our, our dates were filling up so quickly that we just added um, a bunch more units to our pickups dates. So you might check that out um, if you were wanting bees earlier and we didn't have them, have them available beforehand. You may want to check out our, our uh, website because we did add some more units or we will be in the next day or so. So uh, good news there. One really quick educational thing I wanted to do, if you're, if you're new to beekeeping, then a lot of people have the question of, 
you know, um, what's the difference between a package, a nook, or a single? And what are which are better to buy as as a beekeeper? So I wanted to share this quick note from uh, Michael Kelling. If you don't know Michael, he is a phenomenal beekeeper, but he's also uh, the the force behind the Central Texas Bee School, which is I think there were like eight or nine hundred beekeepers at the Central Texas Bee School last year, and that is coming up in April. So you will uh, see that in our magazine. There's an ad for that, I believe. But if you haven't been to that event, it's phenomenal. Um, so I want to queer, share this quick note from uh, from Michael um, as uh, as we uh, get started here. When asked what's better to buy, whether I should buy a nuke a package or a full uh, hive of bees, I have to ask, how much money do you have? And what do you want to learn? For you to learn the most, the best thing to do is to buy a package of bees. You get to see it from the very beginning. You physically put the bees on foundation and you get to see them draw the wax out and start laying eggs and have the, the brood and uh, larva and all the way through the process. It's also the cheapest to buy a package of bees. Now, if you've got a little more money, then I would buy a nuke because the nuke gives you the full queen. It gives you a better value because it's a month ahead of a package. A package has to draw out all the comb. A nuke already has the comb drawn out and is ready to go. It has brood ready to emerge and will grow quickly. If you have even more money, even quicker is to buy a full box of bees, a full hive ready to go. They are in production. All you have to do is add brood, excuse me, add supers to that and they can start making honey right away. So what do you want to learn and how much money do you have? If you don't have a lot of money, you have to start with packages. If, you, if money is no object and you're ready to go and you know everything about bees already, then you can buy a full hive. So it depends on your situation. It depends on what you want to learn and how fast you want to grow. Packages take a longer time but are cheaper. Nukes are a month faster but are a little more expensive. And full hives of bees are the most expensive, but they are in production mode, ready to start any time. Thank you, Michael. I, I couldn't agree more with that. So he, he just did a beautiful job of, of summary, summarizing that. So um, a couple quick updates. Uh, February. So our Austin area branch in Round Rock is uh, under construction. They are wrapping up the uh, finish out of, of, that, um, of that building. And we are about to start moving inventory in. And so we are hoping... Um, late February, that store should be open. So we'll be emailing, announcing, and telling it to the world uh, the grand opening date. We don't have a grand open date just yet, but it is it is getting really, really close, and we are so excited about that. Um, Sherry, do you want to tell us about this month's magazine? Um, of course, right? February's issue is couldn't be fuller, okay? So every month, and y'all heard this over and over again, I try to stay under 70 pages, but I just can't do it. Too much to talk about. So um, I'm going to go from the, the talking about the magazine to the spotlight, Blake, if that's all right. So the, the issue this month is symptoms of nutritionally starved hives. That's by Blake. Foul brood, AFB and EFB compared. I really want y'all to look at that because the difference between American foul brood and European foul brood, big difference, big difference. Check that out. And what's the buzz? Lynn Jones did it again. This one's hysterical to me. Um, it's about uh, what's that weird hole in the end of hive tools. I mean, you gotta love that. So, uh, and quick tips. I wanna real quick before I get to the spotlight, quick tips, please look at those every month. I've got a few in there, planning for spring, uh, when and how to feed pollen patties. Can I make a split and still produce honey this year? That's a big deal. And we're going to be talking about splits later, I'm sure, tonight. And if you didn't get more, uh, the January issue, I talked about how to calculate queens 
to know what to order for those splits. So those two kind of come uh, piggyback each other. That was 30, page 38 in uh, the January issue. All right, so Blake has this slide pulled up for me. So let's talk about an article that came in from Cade Houston. Now, that is not Houston, that's Houston. I interviewed him too for the, in the same issue. We're talking about pre preparing for Varroa season. I know we all dunk our heads and go, I don't want to do this again. Well, guess what? We have to do this again. It's a really good, thorough article. He is one of the tech transfer team members, um, actually based out of AM. So he's Texas, but he's with Be Informed Partnership. Um, they're a nationwide uh, an organization that keeps up with the Varroa mites and the, the actual um, how, how many losses we've got and so forth. Uh, but let me just briefly hit a couple of things. So uh, we all know Varroa mite was, has been around since what, like 87, and is a major determining factor in whether your colony lives or dies, and is how well you corrode, control the Varroa mites is, is whether that matters. So test, 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 he says, it says it right there, test, test, test. Mite monitoring is one of the most crucial tools you'll need to utilize in your beekeeping operation. No truer words spoken. This next statement, absolutely put a pin in this. If you are determining treatment times based off of visual cues, that means I'm looking at it, only going by what I see, such as seeing mites on bees, mite signs such as frass, that's a fancy way of saying mite poop, um, in the cells or to farm wing virus, you have missed the mark, totally missed the mark. Your levels are most likely well above treatment thresholds. So this is not what we want to do. We need to test, right? One of the things that I really loved about his article is he taught me something, and I learned something from all of our guest writers, but he taught me a new trick on doing tests. And it has to do with creating a V shape to do your dunk, when you thunk your bees off of the, each frame of your brood nest. And he uses a piece of flashing, a piece of metal, so it's in a V shape and it stays in that so he can put the, dunk the bees down into what he do, goes into detail about or your uh, easy check, your Varroa easy check. Super great information. I could go on and on, but please go to it. It's, um, and you know, I didn't write down what page this is on, my apologies, but go to the second page in the magazine and there's a contents and it's right there. You can click on it in the contents page and it takes you straight to it. All right, I got it all out. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Shay. I love that cover photo. I think that's just Isn't the coolest gorgeous? cover photo ever. I love that's that. That's Lark Treadwell, yeah. Scout B. Follow her. That's a click it link on that Facebook uh, little circle beside her name. Really cool, cool B. Okay, that's so cool. And I love that, like right in the middle there, right above where it says the B supply, you can see those old swarm cells or what's <laughs> left of the old swarm cells. Yeah, kind of the the residual. So at one point, that wild hive formed. Super cool. Thanks, Sherry. <laughs> um, spring splits class. If you guys are interested in learning how to make splits, we have um, an in-person one March 11th and March 18th in uh, our stores. If you want to take a virtual spring split class, you can um, stream that live anytime um, you, under advanced classes on our website. Um, okay. Uh, as we jump into the material here, I want to do something slightly different. I want to ask a favor of you guys. Um, we are constantly trying out new products at the Bee Supply. We really love to be um, as innovative as we can. Anytime there's a new product on the market, we want to be carrying it. Um, we love inventing products, um, or if you've invented a product, uh, we love to uh, try to carry that. So um, let us know if you've invented something or so. But this is, uh, I want to I want to pull you guys on three different products. So there's three different products. I'm going to try to do this in a lot of our meetings. Just I want to get your feet, your honest feedback. Um, would you buy this product? It's that simple. And so this one is super simple. It's super cheap. It's just a little uh, front porch shader that you uh, screw onto the front of your beehive or nail onto the front. And you can see it just provides them some, uh, some shade on the front of their hive for those hot summers in the South. So... Um, it's super easy, just yes or no. I, I would buy this product or I wouldn't. And just be totally honest, we don't carry it yet. <laughs> so I have no, and I didn't invent this. Um, so we have no emotional connection to 
to to this product. Um, and uh, so I'm just looking for some honest feedback, like, oh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen, or, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, so cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, lots of great answers there. Um, I will, the product, our product team will be thrilled to to get this get this feedback so looks like about 40 percent uh would buy it and about 60 percent wouldn't um okay so this other product we're considering carrying so this is kind of it's really different i'm trying to figure out how i feel about this so this is a clear view veil so what what you do is you take your current b veil so whatever if you have a super suit or bought a b veil from anybody anywhere you cut out a square in the front of it, and this is a clear, ple clear plexiglass, thin plexiglass um, square that you basically clamps into that hole that you cut, and it offers you a clear view of whatever uh, you're looking at in the VR. Because you know, how looking through a B veil can sometimes, it, you know, looking through that screen kind of distorts the view a little bit, especially if you're looking for eggs or looking for a queen or something. Well, with this, you just cut out a square and then uh, this little piece of plexiglass fits into that square you've cut out and allows you to just get a really um, a really clear view of, of what you're looking at. So uh, I don't know, I, I love the concept uh, of like being able to see out really clearly. Um, I'm trying to decide if, you know, plexiglass is going to uh, get too dirty or I don't know. I'm curious to see what what you guys think if this is something that uh, you'd look at and go oh I, I I'd try that or yeah I can see well enough through through my veil as is um, cool okay again um, about forty percent said yes about sixty percent said no so um, looks like that's uh, there we go super helpful. And all right, last one. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about this one, but I get excited about all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I, I have lots of ideas that at three o'clock in the morning, moving bees all night, I'm like, that is such a good idea. This, this is such a good idea. And then the next morning, I'm like, oh, wow, that was a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> but this one is, um, all right. So when you're testing for varroa mites using the easy check, you know, you usually do an alcohol wash and it kills all the bees. So this is a CO2 dispenser. So you insert a little CO2 cartridge into this dispenser, and this all kind of comes as one kit, and you put your bees in the easy check, you, you spray the CO2 into the easy check, it puts all the bees to sleep, and then you shake, shake it just like you would if you had alcohol in it, the varroa mites fall through just like they do with the alcohol wash. Um, you count your varroa mites, and then a couple minutes later, your bees all wake up and your bees are fine. So this is doing a varroa mite test using the easy check jar. And instead of alcohol, you're using CO2, so it doesn't kill any of the bees. So you just give it a few minutes and your bees wake, all, wake back up and you can dump them back into your hive. So it's basically a no kill varroa mite uh no kill varroa mite test um and uh kind of like a sticky board but this is this is way more effective than uh this is way more effective than uh say a sticky board or a powdered sugar test this is as effective as the alcohol wash so cool okay yeah good feedback on that one too it looks like um, most of you most of you like that idea so um, this this is this is a product that I I'm 99% sure will carry. So you'll be seeing that on our shelves uh, this this spring. So okay, enough of that. Um, uh, I'm going to go to uh, live in the bee yard real quick, and this is a little bit different for live in the bee yard because uh, I'm in California. And um, and so it's a little bit different. I'm kind of giving you a little bit of behind the scenes on what we're doing in California. And then I'm going to explain a little bit more once the video is over. I do want to apologize to you guys in advance. Um, I filmed this kind of off the cuff out in the bee yard uh, this a couple hours ago. And I don't have like my normal microphone and tripod and uh, all of that that I usually have when I film in Texas. So the audio isn't quite as good, um, but I think you'll find what you're seeing pretty interesting and, and not 
what most people get to see uh, as far as the beekeeping world. So enjoy. Hey everybody. So um, I'm not in the normal bee yard for the live in the bee yard portion, obviously. I'm actually in California in the Central Valley. So back home where I live in Texas, um, it's everything's covered in snow, uh, sleet, and ice. So I couldn't exactly get out in the bee yard to, to film a video. And we're busy putting bees out in the almond orchards here in Central California anyway. And so um, I thought I'd do a couple of quick videos just showing you guys what we're doing out here in the almonds. Um, you can see that uh, these trees are not blooming yet, but they're, but they're getting somewhat close. Um, we're not too far from, from bloom. You can see this, uh, this bloom right here is, um, you know, you can see those buds and they're really, they're getting close to, to blooming. But most of, the, most of the orchards here are seven to 10 days away. Usually the almonds start blooming uh, around the 15th of February. And if you didn't know a little bit about the almonds industry and the beekeeping industry, you know, they're really very closely tied together. I mean, um, without bees, almonds produce two to 300 pounds per acre. With bees, they produce two to 3,000 pounds per acre. So almonds trees have to have bees in order to um, make an almond crop. And it takes virtually every commercially managed beehive in the country to pollinate the almond groves. That's how many almonds there are. And 90% of the world's almonds are produced right here in the Central Valley in California. And so it's the biggest pollination event in the world. Um, the almond pollination event. Um, as a commercial beekeeper, you know, uh, it, it, most commercial beekeepers say that, you know, what we, what we, the honey we produce and everything else we do the rest of the year pays our bills and our profit is what we make on almonds uh, because the growers pay us as beekeepers to um, bring our bees out here to almonds to pollinate their crops. And so, um, it's it's uh, been a wonderful synergistic relationship for years between almond growers and beekeepers and it's been really good for the bees because you know I mean you all know what conditions are like you know throughout the rest of the country it's it's cold it's rainy it's snowing it's sleeting and you know the bees are just clustered tightly and will be for quite some time and then here in the Central Valley you know there's a pollen flow um, almond pollen is one of the best pollens for honeybees. It's really high in protein. Um, and so these almond trees will start blooming here in another week and the bees will start growing like crazy. They explode in strength, um, unlike they would anywhere else in the country because everywhere else there's nothing for the bees to forage on. So it's a really unique uh, synergistic relationship again between beekeepers and almond growers but it's great for the bees because of how quickly they're able to grow um, as a result of this really nutritious almond pollen. And they'll be here um, until about mid-March and then in mid-March we'll load them up and then bring them back to Texas or wherever else and make splits. So, um, so what we're doing right now is we're busy um, getting our bees and loading them up on trucks, uh, bringing them to California, spending all night long, putting them into the orchards, uh, making sure they're strong enough uh, because the growers, you know, want a certain strength of hive in order to properly pollinate their crops because uh, they've got to have a lot of bees to do the pollination. And so we'll go through and put uh, one to two hives per acre and, and throughout these almond orchards to properly pollinate the crops. And so, um, so most of my bees are in, in, in here in almonds in California. Um, some are still back in Texas that we'll, we'll use to make some early splits, et cetera. Um, but a lot of our bees, like you can see behind us here, are, are in almonds. And uh, you can see the little sensors on the front of them, uh, the little target looking thing. So um, that's actually a little sensor and then there's a sensor inside each hive. Um, and that sensor tells us how many frames of bees there are, how many frames of brood there are. It's also a GPS locator. Um, and it gives us all this data that we can see on our smartphone. I'd, I'd show you, but I'm filming on my smartphone. Um, and it shows all this data in the palm of our hand of where our bees are, how strong they are, if there's an issue, um, et cetera. And so um, I'll probably show a couple pictures of that during the later part of the webinar. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. It, it really helps us to, um, it helps us to 
bring some tech into the beekeeping world, which is very, very much needed. So uh, we'll take a look at a couple hives just to kind of show you what they look like, you know, and I'll tell you, hey, this, this hive will make great in almonds, this hive won't. It'll just be an interesting comparison to what you may be seeing in your own beehives. Um, but there's not a lot you can be doing in your bees right now because it's just cold. Really all you can do is uh, make sure they've got enough feed on the warm days and uh, wait for spring. Um, but um, the roller coaster of spring is coming quickly where you've got warm days, cold days, and everything in between. And, and, uh, and that's starting here in central, in central California. The temperature is pretty even. It's you know 60s during the day. 40s during the night and it's it's very very consistent which also helps the bees build up a bit so um so yeah that's what we're doing here in central california and we'll be here for another couple weeks wrapping up the placement of bees and then we'll get a couple weeks break and then we'll be back in california to get our bees uh, back home so when i'm grading bees in california or grading bees for california we have to move quickly because sometimes we'll have to look at a few thousand hives in a day. And so um, we're usually breaking the boxes apart uh, quickly in order to see what the strength of the hive is. And so we'll break the hive apart and then we'll count how many frames of bees uh, we see in these hives. So, you know, like in this one, we count from the bottom. We've got one two three four five about six frames covered in bees and then we'll count the same from the bottom we've got six up there six seven eight nine ten about eleven eleven and a half so this hive is about eleven frames of bees which is considered fantastic um, that's a really good a really good hive of bees for for almonds um, and so you can go through quickly and do these counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This one's about twelve frames, and so on. And so if we're if we're grading our hives, you know, we'll go through and do this to each and every hive. If we're doing an inspection, so if a grower hires us to inspect an orchard for them, we'll grade at random about ten percent of the hives in that orchard. <laughs> And, uh, and then aggregate that across all the, all the bees in that orchard. So we're only inspecting about 10% if we're doing an inspection. If we're grading before they go into almonds to make sure they're strong enough, we're actually looking at every single hive. And if it's weaker than five frames of bees, we'll combine it with another hive in order to make sure it is strong enough, or we'll cull it out completely and, and not send it into, into almonds. But we have to be very picky about what goes into orchards um, because you know we don't want to send weak bees because uh, we won't get paid for it and the grower won't be happy. So, so we have to be pretty picky about what does and doesn't go into orchards. So one other thing I wanted to show you guys really quickly was just inside the orchard and, and what it looks like inside of an almond orchard. And uh, just to give you a quick overview of, of what it looks like, I know this isn't terribly practical for your beekeeping journey, but, but it's interesting and, and it, it is a big part of the beekeeping industry. So, um, but just to show you, you know, this is a very normal look of uh, inside of an almond orchard. And it's so beautiful when these trees actually start blooming. It's just absolutely beautiful when these trees are solid white, but you can see these buds on the trees you know, they are about a week or so away from blooming, which is super exciting to us as beekeepers because uh, us and our bees are just really ready for uh, the bees to have something to eat. So, um, and then they keep these orchard floors. You can see how manicured they are. Um, and they keep these orchard floors super clean because when they're ready to harvest the almonds, they will shake these trees and all the almonds will fall um, onto the ground and then they'll sweep them up off of the orchard floor. And, uh, and so this floor is kind of like their factory floor that they've got to keep uh, really clean uh, because they're gonna shake these almonds onto it. In fact, you can even see um, you know, some almonds left over from last year that they didn't uh, necessarily get swept up um, off the ground. But, um, and then you can also see these irrigation lines uh, that drip water for the almonds because obviously it's very dry in the central valley 
And so these irrigation lines um, are super efficient as far as conserving water and they just drip water when the trees need it. Um, they used to years ago flood irrigate and so they would actually flood these entire orchards in order to water them. Uh, but obviously that's uh, a huge waste of water and so now they just drip the water exactly where these almonds, uh, almond trees need need the water. Um, but it's cert there's certainly a big uh, water shortage in the Central Valley and has been for a while, but it's been especially bad the past few years um, and it's not getting any better. So um, here you can see these buds are getting, getting pretty close to blooming, uh, to opening up as well, uh, which is, which is great. Our bees are super excited and eager for uh, the bloom. And here's some more of those almonds that you can see that they missed um, on the ground. So, you, you know, the almonds have a thick shell on the outside and then inside, you know, there's the inner shell and then there's the almond. So you can see the almond. And of course, these have been sitting here on the orchard floor since, you know, last fall when they harvested. So uh, they don't look great. But, um, but yeah, there's always a few that, they're, that they miss. So um, <laughs> honestly, on a personal note, um, it's always pretty chaotic here in California. And, you know, there's a lot of work to be done at night and it's a ton of logistics and we're moving thousands of beehives in every night. Um, I love just coming to the orchard during the day <laughs> because it's so quiet um, and peaceful. And you can hear, there's just like, you can just kind of hear the birds and it's, um, kind of beautiful how it's manicured uh, and um, you know it's a little bit of uh, peace in the midst of the chaos when you can uh, come into an orchard for a few minutes. Um, oh one other quick thing I wanted to show you guys more and more growers are doing a better and better job of leaving some forage for bees inside the almond orchards um, and so you can see there's a little bit along the edges here but a lot of them are getting better and better at actually planting these rows with bee friendly forage and, and then leaving that for the bees while they're here for almond pollination, which is fantastic. As that awareness grows, um, they're, they're leaving more and more of that forage in the center rows for the bees, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. There are some nuts that didn't get shook off the tree. So you can see these are some of the nuts that um, the shaker didn't actually get off the tree. Uh, that are left on from last year and then those new buds that are getting ready to open. So, so yeah, there you go. That is it. Um, a quick little view of what it looks like inside the almond orchards. So there you go. Um, hopefully you found that somewhat entertaining to see a little sneak peek of what goes on in the almond orchards. And, you know, this is a, a picture I took uh, last week, actually, when I was here, I, I, I have an amazing crew I'll show you in just a minute that runs a lot of what we do here in California. And then I'm often here Wednesday through Friday and then fly back and forth uh, between Texas and California. But at last week, it was beautiful weather. And I walked up into the foothills and just took this picture of uh, kind of looking out into the Central Valley and all these dark squares that you can see here. Those are all almond orchards. And so you just have tens of thousands of acres of almond orchards. And, and this is the hill. The, I'm standing in the foothills to the west, looking into the valley to the east. And then you probably can't see in the picture, but if it was zoomed up a little bit, all the way on that horizon, you can see another line of mountains, uh, which is like the Yosemite uh, area. And, and that's, you know, so you're kind of looking at, at the valley. We do a lot of work for other beekeepers. And so part of what we do is work other people's bees in January. So we go out there, a lot of people overwinter their bees in California. So they'll send their hives out to California and then we'll go out there with our crew and then we'll, we'll grade, feed, uh, it's put their bees in almond orchards, et cetera, and kind of care for other people's bees uh, for them. So this is one of those holding yards. And this is our guys uh, working in, in one of those holding yards. And just, uh, it's, it's very beautiful. I mean, this is kind of in those foothills, you know, of uh, looking to the west. And, and this is, you know, working other people's bees. You know, you would think it would be bad for bees to be in this. There, I think there were 10,000 hives in this holding yard that we worked. But it's really, you know, during the winter there, it's a pretty consistent, you know, 30 degrees at night, 40 degrees during the day. So the bees really don't fly all winter long. I mean, they just stay in those hives kind of like, uh, 
you know, the, the refrigerated sheds that I put my bees in in Idaho, uh, it's kind of like a, just a consistent refrigerator and the bees just stay indoors. Um, they don't really fly much. And there's just another picture of, of, uh, that, uh, that holding yard in, in the foothills. But, uh, so right now what we're doing is we're loading up, unloading truckloads of bees. So you can see like, here's a truckload of bees that came in. So we're, we're getting these bees off the truck and, uh, we're, we're grading them. So we're, we're checking these bees. We tried a couple interesting things this spring that you are this, this week, uh, this month, I'm sorry, I haven't slept much, um, this month. Um, and, uh, when it comes to combining hives, these are a couple new methods that we tried that were really, really effective that you might want to try if you're ever considering combining hives. So the first one right here on the far right, when we, when we, and this is, this is something I'd only do when it's chilly outside, you know, 40s to 40s to maybe 60 degrees during the day. But when we would open up a hive, um, there would be bees in the bottom box and bees in the top box. But there would often be like 80% of the bees would be either in the top or bottom box. And then you'd have the other box with maybe 20% of the bees. And so we would just stand the box up on end on top of the bottom box, just like you see in the picture here. And then we would let it sit that way for a couple of hours, sometimes even overnight. And what, what would happen is the, the box that had the queen and any brood, all the bees would migrate into that box, whether it was this bottom box or this top box. And then uh, you could come back in a couple hours or the next morning and you'd have one box with all the bees in it. And, and then you could take that box that now has all the bees in it and combine it with another weaker hive that had box that had all the bees in it. So two of these together. And then you would end up with a really nice sized hive. So it was just kind of a way to get all the bees into one box. It actually worked really well. Another thing we did was on the far left here. Um, well, so much for that video. Um, we weighed these, uh, we, our, our crews call them these skyscrapers. And so we would take, you know, uh, six different uh, hives that were really weak. So we had, you know, all these different hives with two or three frames of bees in them. And so very weak. We would stack them all up into these tall stacks and then let them sit for about a day. And they would, would go back when it's chilly in the morning. And then all those bees would be, you know, in, in a couple of these boxes. And then you would just take those two boxes all the bees were in and you've got one really strong hive. So just some interesting methods to combine hives. And this is, you know, these are, <laughs> uh, all of our bees do not look like this, uh, but these are, this is what amazing bees look like in, in California. You know, these are what we call 16 framers. I mean, they, every single frame is covered with bees. And, and this is kind of the holy grail of beekeeping of, of you know, what, what we love to see. But I wanted to show it to you because you can see these little sensors I was talking about right here in the middle. And that's the little sensor that is telling us how many frames of bees we've got, how much brood we've got, et cetera. And then sometimes we put a pollen patty in them as well. Uh, so they have plenty of pollen up until the bloom starts. A uh, quick little plug for our super suits. Um, we all wear them. And sometimes in those holding yards with all those bees, uh, when you have a warm day and they actually do fly a little bit and they haven't flown in like, a month they get a little on the grouchy side um especially this year i don't know what was different about this year but um they were um this these weren't our bees they were they were uh, someone else's bees but they were not happy i mean you can see i um, mean we weren't we weren't getting stung but there were so many bees you'd have to wipe your veil uh to, to see you know they would just be all over it um, and then after they flew for a few days, they calmed down. You know, I think it was just that they hadn't flown in a month. And so uh, now we're opening them, disturbing them, and they can fly. And, and they, they didn't appreciate us waking them up from their winter hibernation. But um, something happened that I had never, I've experienced this once or twice in my life, but never to this ex extent. Um, the bees would, would land on our veil. And they would hold on and they would they would try to sting you through the veil. And obviously they can't, but they were they were hanging onto that veil and they would kind of stick their stingers through the veil and they'd be fanning their wings trying to get in. And you would have small amount of venom coming out of their stinger and their wings were fanning it into your face. And so um, and you had thousands of bees doing this all day long. And um, and so. 
you know, none of us are allergic to bees, but still our noses were running and our eyes were watering. And like, if you licked your lips, you could taste the venom and it would, your tongue would tingle a little bit just because you had all these bees with like tiny amounts of venom on their stingers and they were planting their wings and kind of fanning that venom into your face all day long. Um, maybe it's a new, uh, maybe it's a new defense mechanism that bees are learning. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was kind of crazy, um, but, uh, but, but very interesting. So um, anyway, the super suits, they work great. I mean, that we, we, we wear them all the time in all conditions. So um, just another shot of a holding yard. This is right before the bees um, actually go into the orchards. That's loading them up. This is late in the evening when it's chilly, um, you know, sun's already down and we're loading them up onto our trucks. There's some of our flatbed trucks. And uh, in the old, you know, in, in most years, you know, we have a map like this on the left that the grower gives us that we're supposed to put, you know, 30, 40 hives on each X. Um, these days it's becoming more and more high tech. And um, we work some with a company called Bee Hero and they, uh, all the orchards are now uploaded into apps. And uh, these apps now show us uh, where we are, um, where the bees go in the orchard, how many hives go on each drop. You know, it's all uh, becoming very, uh, very technologically advanced. So probably means nothing to you. But for us, it means that we don't have to squint at this little hand-drawn map at three o'clock in the morning and, and try to figure out where on earth we are. Uh, technology is creeping into beekeeping as well. Uh, last slide on this, I think, is this is just, these are some of the hives. We spread them out in the orchards, and uh, the next morning, the bees um, are come out of the hives, reorient themselves, and uh, start looking for some almonds. Oh, not everything always goes well. Um, it was super muddy uh, last week, and uh, this was a forklift, and uh, uh, we uh, one of our crew members backed it off the trailer, and it was dark, obviously, didn't see this ditch and back the forklift right into the ditch and immediately flipped it over. And uh, fortunately, he was perfectly fine. Uh, that's what matters. But all sorts of, it, it's kind of like the Wild West out moving bees in California. Um, and not, not everything goes according to plan, uh, but uh, we've never had anyone get hurt. So that's, that's what's most important. Um, final little thing here. Um, this is, uh, some of you may know Charlie uh, Agar with Charlie Bee Company. They are filming a... Um, uh, a TV show about beekeeping. It's kind of a reality TV show, but for beekeeping. And they had season one came out last year. Season two will air, I think, this spring. Um, and it's uh, going to air, I think, on PBS and EarthX. And um, and it's a it's a pretty big. It's getting to be a pretty big show. And and I've known Charlie for a very long time. And so he came out and he's doing an episode on the bee supply, an episode on Desert Creek honey. And so he, he's been out here filming with us and that's been a lot of fun. Super cool. That's him getting to drive one of our, one of our forklifts on the right. Uh, the top left is him with Justin Russell with prime bees. Uh, Justin is one of our awesome, awesome uh, managers and team leaders out here in California, along with uh, Cade, my brother and uh, Hayden and Caesar. And uh, so we've had a great time filming with him. And so you'll see us um, on that TV show. It's called Charlie B. Um, and that'll be uh, this spring. So we'll we'll send a link out to everybody. Okay, let's um, let's talk about practical beekeeping. What you need to be doing in your bees, um, and uh, and and what you need to be thinking about as we kind of ramp up into into springtime. So this is I, I always refer to this time of year as the roller coaster because the temperatures are all over the place. You know, you've got these freezing cold days. You get these warm days, flowers start blooming a little bit, then it freezes and they all die. And, and you just get these roller coasters of temperatures. I really love keeping an eye on the temperature outlooks. This is a temperature outlook for February through April. And these, of course, are not always accurate, but they, they sometimes can be decently accurate. And so I like keeping an eye on those just to see what, uh, what they're predicting. This uh, this was in Texas in February 2021. This was, uh, I think, February 1st, 2021. And we had uh, the elm trees were blooming. Uh, this was February of 2022. And you all know what it's like right now. And it kind of looks more like this. And a lot of the South after this, the ice storm we had across a lot of the South. Uh, and yet we had flowers blooming last week. 
and now we've had these hard freezes and it's killing everything and and then it'll start trying to bloom again soon so we really just see this roller coaster effect that bees can deal with i mean they're 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 a part of nature too and they can deal with these extremes but it's not ideal either um so you'll see you'll see a lot of early spring blooms you know these mustards and henbit and dandelions uh you know willows and uh you know there's so many different early spring blooms but but they're they'll they'll start blooming they'll freeze back they'll start again and so that's that's really really normal i wanted to throw this up there again i, I showed this last month and um mentioned that this is a map that we're really working on this is i was too excited i i don't do a good job of uh keeping my mouth shut and perfecting something before i put it out there sometimes and i just i'm so excited to show it to you guys so um, we're working on a way more detailed version of this map. This is the rough draft version. It's accurate, decently accurate, but we're working on a version of this that is by county across the entire United States. So county by county, um, when the pollen flow starts and stops, when the honey flow starts and stops, um, when freezes start and stop um, nationwide, county by county. So um, this is kind of the, the preliminary draft, and it's pretty accurate as far as when the significant pollen flow starts. And by significant, I mean significant, you know, like there's a significant pollen flow and it's going to most likely continue. Um, but it, you can get a lot of variation between counties, especially when you get into more mountainous regions. Um, and so we're, we're working on drilling really way down, but um, but it'll it'll be a bit before that map comes out because it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, but this is this is kind of to hold you over uh, until until then. So kind of what I'm seeing right now, and I, I'm looking at bees in California and Texas and uh, the central U.S., and I'm looking at bees that have come in from Florida. You know, one of the neat things is part of my job in Cal is to check on people's bees and make sure they're doing OK, see if they're strong enough for almonds. And so I get to look at um, tens of thousands of hives that have come from all over the entire country um, and see kind of where they are and what they're doing. And so it gives you kind of this unique nationwide snapshot of, of what bees are doing. And in general, if I'm generalizing it, you know, brood rearing is ramping up. You know, most hives I see, you know, certainly true from Texas and uh, in the South, you know, they've got a frame or two of brood in most cases. And so they're 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 ramping up brood production, but we're not in full swing yet. But they're just you know they're just starting to rear brood. There's a pollen flow roller coaster in most areas. We kind of talked about that. You kind of get these starts and stops of pollen flow, the temperature roller coaster. And so you've got bees that are out flying one day, clustered tight the next day. And and when bees have to um, cluster really tightly because it's really cold, and then they expand and fly and then cluster tightly again, that takes a lot of energy on the bees part. They have to eat a lot of honey or stored syrup in order to uh, keep the hive warm and then go out and fly. And so keep an eye on food. You know, if, if you can have, especially if you've got a couple frames of brood, a really strong hive, I'm more worried about a strong hive starving to death this time of year than a weak hive. Because a weak hive, if they've got plenty of honey stores, they're not really eating that much honey. They don't really need much honey to survive. A really strong, healthy hive needs a lot of food um, to keep that many bees warm, start rearing brood, et cetera. So keep an eye on your food, and we'll talk about this more in just a little bit, but, um, but keep an eye on your food stores, February and March especially. A lot of areas had a lot of uh, snow, ice, cold weather this past week. And so, you know, once it warms up again, in most areas, it's going to warm up pretty well this coming week. Just do a damage assessment and, and check on your bees. If you've got strong, healthy hives with lots of bees, it shouldn't phase them at all. Um, if you've got really small, weak hives, unfortunately, this is what often happens after these really cold snaps come through. If you have a hive that didn't have enough bees to keep the hive warm, then they'll freeze to death or, in this case, starve to death. And so this is kind of a very classic, sad picture. You know, all these bees are dead. Um, interestingly, on the right here, you can see you can you can see the queen. She even had a yellow dot on her back. Uh, this is the queen bee. 
And there were just very few bees left in this hive. So it was a very small, you know, less than a frame of bees hive. Um, and they also didn't have food. And so a hive like this just really doesn't stand a chance uh, when it gets that cold. And, and so if they run out of food or if they're really small, they just can't stand up to that kind of cold. And, and you'll see this happen. And when this happens, it's incredibly sad. Um, but I usually just brush all the dead bees off and then store that comb. And, and, you know, you'll bounce quickly back. Um, uh, they'll, they'll bounce back very quickly once uh, you install a package or a nook in, into, into this woodenware because the comb's already drawn out. These are just some pictures of what I'm seeing in some February hives. I mean, you know, not, not a ton of brood, but some, you know, one to two frames that look like this. They're bringing in some pollen, depending on where you are. Um, they've got some uncapped brood, some cat brood. I'm not expecting to see a ton of this, but but I am seeing some. I am seeing bees going on cleansing flights and orientation flights. Uh, you know, once you've got those 60 degree days, you you will see a burst of activity as the bees come out to go to the bathroom, especially if it's been a minute since they've been able to come out. And so you'll see that intense activity outside the hive when you do get a warm day because everybody's got to go to the bathroom and any new bees that emerge you know, and maybe the past week that haven't been able to get out and do an orientation flight. So you'll certainly see when it does get warm, these bursts of activity. And, and that's that's very normal to see. As far as feeding goes, you know, I, my goal is to maintain 20 pounds of stores um, for a hive that is at least one deep box full of bees. And I want to do that through February. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a ton of food because, you know, we're starting to come-ish out of winter, depending on where you are. So I'm not trying to maintain 40, 50, 60 pounds at this point. I'm just making sure they've got 20 plus pounds, 20 to 30 pounds of stores. And um, if you're in the Southern half of the United States, I'm switching to one-to-one -one feeding because I'm one-to-one -one syrup tends to encourage the bees to build up and start rearing brood. Whereas two-to-one, they're quicker to store. So if you're in the Northern half of the United States, you know, I would I would actually feed a sugar brick or uh, or fondant rather than liquid feed this time of year. Um, but if you're in the southern half and you're getting consistent days that are in the 60s, your bees are starting to fly and they do need food, I would go with the one-to-one -one, uh, syrup uh, or you can continue doing a sugar brick through, through February. Um, and again, I would check two or three times through the month of February as your bees really start ramping up their brood production check two or three times to make sure that they've got enough food. Pollen patties, you know, it's not critical. It certainly isn't going to hurt to feed a pollen patty in February. What I do personally is I watch for those really cold weeks. And if I see that, hey, we're about to get a week where my bees aren't going to be able to fly, then I'll go throw a pollen patty in between the boxes because I know they're starting to rear brood. And if they're going a week where they can't fly, and it's cold and that freeze just killed all the blooming plants, then it's going to take one to two weeks for, um, for those plants to recover and start producing pollen again, depending on the plant. And so if, you know, if, I, if I know my hive is strong and they've got a couple frames of brood and I know that, hey, we're about to get this cold week, they're going to be clustered inside, and then it's going to be another week before the plants recover. I'll throw a pollen patty in there just so they don't start cannibalizing that brood that they reared. Uh, because if they run out of protein and resources, the bees will start cannibalizing that brood because they don't have anything to feed it. So um, I'm, I will feed a pollen patty um, when, uh, when I see those cold fronts coming up. Varroa mites. So I recommend doing a varroa mite test in late February. I, I wouldn't really do it in early February. And again, this, this is if you're in the southern half of the United States, you know, but once you start, once you start getting to routine daytime temperatures in the 60s, low 60s, I want to do a varroa mite test. Um, and, and really, you know, I reference that number a lot, you know, like when the daytime temperatures kind of get up to the low 60s or start dropping below the mid 60s. And, and that's kind of associated with bee flight and how if bees are clustered or not clustered. But a lot of management happens when the temperatures uh, get above 60 and a lot of management ends when they get below 60. So that's a really helpful temperature to keep in mind. You know, once you're 60 and above, 
fee management kind of kicks into gear. Once it's 60 and below, not as much that we're doing in our bees. So when you get those 60 and plus degree days routinely, doesn't hurt to do a mite test. If your mites are more than two per hundred bees, February or March could be a good time to treat. You know, once you start getting into your honey flow in May or June, you really don't want, you can't treat your, you shouldn't treat your bees. And so you want to, if your bees need any form of mite treatment, you want to do that before your honey flow. So February, March, April is kind of your window to take care of varroa mite for the spring. Um, so hop guard, oxalic acid, formic acid, uh, apigard um, are all good options uh, for, for the spring months. Just keep in mind, you know, we're, we're still down here in February. And so varroa mite threats are pretty low, but they are increasing as brood production ramps up, so do varroa mite levels. So something to be aware of as we move forward. Um, sticky boards, if you don't want to uh, kill your bees doing the alcohol wash, you can use sticky boards or you can use our little CO2 cartridges that we'll have in stock in a couple of weeks. Uh, but sticky boards or our CO2 cartridges are good ways to avoid killing bees um, to do a varroa mite test. Sticky boards aren't as accurate, but they are really easy. That's the advantage of sticky boards. So even though sticky boards are not as accurate, it's better than nothing. Um, and you can follow, I won't read all this off to you, but screenshot this or go back and watch the recording. This just gives you a quick overview of how to use those sticky boards. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple more topics uh, before the Elums take over, but um, uh, overcrowding in February. So this is a really good problem. But remember at the beginning, those pictures I showed of those hives with the sensors in them that were just like insanely full of bees. That's a good problem, but it can be a problem. So if your hive is a couple of boxes for brood boxes and they're just like packed with bees, um, you might want to, you know, I wouldn't do it quite yet, but once you get to late February, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out that temperature again. Once the daytime temperature is consistently in the low 60s uh, on most weeks, if you've got two boxes <laughs> that are just packed full of bees, you need to do something or they're going to swarm. So that may, you know, you may start getting those 60 degrees in February or it may not happen until April, depending on where you are. But um, in most of Texas, you know, that's going to happen, uh, you know, in February at some point. Some In some areas, it's already happening in Texas. In other areas, it won't happen until late February. But, um, you know, below 60 degrees routinely, I'm not really worried about bees swarming. Once you start consistently getting above 60, if they're really jam-packed, I'm a little worried about swarming. So there's you have three options if you have hives that are just totally packed out with bees. You can make a split, you can add boxes, or you can equalize. So February splits, I don't really recommend them. It's hard to find queens. You can find mated queens from Hawaii in February. So that's an option, but it's tough, they're tough to find and they're super expensive. Um, allowing the bees to raise their own queen is slow and it's risky because, uh, you know, they, 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 there may not be enough drones to mate with a queen in February. You, so that's a problem. You've got a, a huge potential for inclement weather when the queen needs to go out and mate if they raise their own. You know, the weather is pretty awful in February and, and March in, in a lot of cases. And so if you try to make a split and let the bees raise their own queen, the odds that she gets mated properly is not great. If a hive already has swarm cells, you know, that's, you know, if your hive already has swarm cells in it, uh, then I would go ahead and make a split because once a hive has swarm cells, it is almost impossible to prevent them from swarming. And we'll talk about this more um, in March. We actually have a special guest in March that's going to be speaking on swarming, catching swarms and doing bee removals. So super excited about that. But, you know, if you if you have a hive that's preparing to swarm and they've already got swarm cells, in my experience, one of the only reliable ways to keep them from swarming is to just go ahead and make a split. So that's the exception. Otherwise, I wouldn't really recommend a February split. What I would recommend is adding boxes. It's simple, quick, it's easy. When the top brood box or super becomes 80% full of bees, time to add another box. 
So you can add a deep box of foundation and lightly feed. Um, and the, your bees, if they're that strong, will probably start drawing out that drawing out that foundation when the daytime temperatures are in the 60s or 70s. And if you lightly feed, then you can kind of keep them busy until you can get queens in March or April and make a split. Um, and so you can just kind of delay them from swarming uh, until you can get queens later in the year by adding a box. One quick tip that I didn't put on here that most people don't know is that a really good way to prevent swarms is by adding a medium or a shallow box uh, with frames in it below your two brood boxes. Bees are much less likely to swarm if they have extra space below their brood nest. So, I mean, I wouldn't do this. I would also add space above because bees rather would rather move up and we're more likely to draw out and fill up boxes that are above them. So add, add boxes up above too. But as a general rule of thumb, if you have issues with swarming, adding space below the brood boxes dramatically reduces a hive's urge to, to swarm. Um, now, if they already have queen cells, again, you're probably just going to need to make a split. But if you've got a bunch of really strong hives, go throw a medium box or a shallow box underneath the two brood boxes. And that uh, does a great job of controlling the swarm behavior. Something about having that empty space below them uh, is super helpful. The other thing I'd recommend is equalizing. So you can share brood bees and honey between hives um, as long as your donor hive that you're taking brood out of has low mite levels, um, no brood disease, uh, and you leave the original donor hive at least one box full of bees this time of year. So don't take all their brood away and then gauge the strength of that donor hive on a warm day over 60 degrees. So if you if you follow those prerequisites, then you can pull two or three frames of bees or brood um, out of a strong hive and give them to weaker hives to help reduce the strength of that strong hive, boost up the strength of weak hives. And that helps prevent swarming as well. Um, keep in mind, if you're equalizing brood, here's how I recommend doing it. I like giving frames of mostly capped brood because that means that it's less effort for the hive you're giving it to. Um, they don't have to, uh, feed a bunch of larva. So I like giving them cat brood and then that cat brood is going to hatch out quicker into adult bees, which is helpful because then it boosts that weak hive, boosts that weak hive more quickly. So I like giving them frames of mostly cat brood. You can shake all the bees off and leave them in the donor hive. Um, I think I've got a slide, uh, yeah, on, on bees too. But um, make sure that um, uh, you can add a frame of brood. You want to always put that frame of brood in the center of the brood nest on the hive you're giving it to. So always keep brood together. And this, this frame of brood you're giving to the weaker hive goes in the very middle where all the bees are because they need to keep it warm. Make sure that the hive you're giving it to has enough bees to fully cover the frame of brood. So if they don't have enough bees to like cover that frame of brood, you're, you're going to waste it because on a cold night, that brood's going to die. Alum, I only recommend adding one frame at a time to weak hives. You don't want to give them two or three frames of brood because they're not going to be able to keep it warm. And then replace the frame in the original donor hive with an empty frame, uh, probably from the weak hive, you know, a frame that's just got comb. Um, you want to put that empty hive on the outside edge of that strong donor hive. You don't want to put it right in the middle uh, because then you break apart that brood nest. You always want to keep brood together this time of year, any time of year, but especially this time of year because they've got to be able to keep it warm. If you put an empty frame right between uh, frames of brood, now you've split the brood nest and they're not going to be able to keep everything warm. So put it on the outside edge. You can also equalize honey this time of year. So if you've got one hive with a whole bunch of extra honey, maybe it died. And then you've got a hive that's short on honey. You can uh, add honey to the weaker hives. So, you know, again, I, I add a frame of honey. You don't want to put a frame of honey right in the middle and break up the brood nest, but you can add it to the outside edge of the, of the brood nest. Um, you can add it, you know, kind of the frame that doesn't, you know, the frame closest to the cluster that doesn't have bees on it is, you know, you can pull that frame out and put this honey there. So it's as close as it can get to the cluster without, you know, without uh, 
breaking up the cluster. Um, uh, yeah, so that's how you, you can add honey. You could also, I mean, if you've got a box full of honey, you can also put the entire box on a hive that needs needs that honey. So you can certainly share honey. And then if you do want to equalize bees, if you've got a hive that is weak and it's really short on bees, um, and you want to give it a frame of brood and bees, you can do that. So there's a couple ways to do it. Um, one way is uh, select a frame from your strong hive um, that's uh, uh, full of larva, and thus you know it's full of nurse bees. And nurse bees integrate into a new hive really easily. They're kind of defenseless and cuddly, and everybody loves a nurse bee. And so they don't really fight if you put them into a different hive. So you can pull out a frame of larva, which will be covered with nurse adult nurse bees. Make sure the queen isn't on that frame. You can smoke the entrance of your weak hive and then shake off the frame of nurse bees in the entrance of your weak hive and, uh, and then put that frame of larva back in your strong hive. Um, and then you can take a frame of cat brood and put it in that weak hive. Um, all those nurse bees will just crawl right into uh, right into that weak hive and integrate into that hive. Um, if there's any uh, foragers mixed in, they'll fly off when you shake them into the entrance. So um, so you can do that. So you, you can add bees to a hive by getting a frame of nurse bees, shake them in the entrance. I've also done it plenty of times where I just get a frame of cat brood out of a strong hive, make sure the queen isn't on it, uh, don't shake the bees off, and stick the whole frame of cat brood and bees right into a weak hive. There's minimal fighting in most cases. Uh, the, you run a slim risk that the bees on that frame might kill the queen in that weaker hive because they don't recognize her, um, but that doesn't usually happen. So you can just take the whole frame of bees and brood and put it in a weak hive, um, or you can just shake those shake the bees off the frame into the entrance of the weak hive, and uh, and that they they integrate in more slowly and more. Uh, uh, they're more dispersed as they enter the hive and they then then they typically won't harm that queen in the hive. So um, we kind of covered that already. Okay, so um, that's my practical tips. James and Sherry are going to talk about another really important practical thing that you need to do as you're coming into the spring months, which is uh, reversing boxes. It's a really common practice um, that that is a part of bee management this time of year. And so I'm going to let them dive into how to reverse boxes and why to reverse boxes. Um, and then I'm going to jump over and answer any questions that uh, that you guys have. So uh, James and Sherry, um, whoops, I'm going to let you guys take it over and I will take over the Q&A. Hi, I'm, trying, I'm trying to find my program. So Stare it off your way, so I'm going to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a question a few moments ago uh, while we were answering them about um, um, expanding boxes when the population reaches 80% and you're concerned about a swarm. The question was, if it's a double box, don't you need to check the bottom box first to see if you need to reverse it? before you expand to that mm -hmm. third box. And that is exactly right. That was that was really good thinking. Um, that's Great part question. of what I talk with this for the night. Sarah's still looking for a slide presentation. It's not coming up, Blake. Um, let me work with it. While I'm looking for this, it's not coming up on my, uh, there we go. There we go, I found it. Right, See, y'all, we're real people doing real things here. Um, we're gonna pretend we're in the bee yard, but now you know we're not. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, great. So before we get started, I'm going to real quick, what is our time? Oh, gosh, we only have 20 minutes. So, Blake, you showed that um, United States with the, our working on, because I'm working with you on that, on getting the pollen flows and the nectar flows by county. If anyone out there wants to participate in that survey and be part of that map, because we need there's a lot of zip codes, y'all. There's a lot of counties in the United States. Please email me at editor at thebeesupply.com, editor at thebeesupply.com, and request for to be part of that survey. 
and we'll get it out to you and you can be part of the results and Blake will put you on that map. So that would be pretty cool. Wouldn't that be pretty cool? Yeah, I would. think so too. And it's so important for us to, to gather as much data as we can around mm. the country. Yes. Uh, it, uh, it allows us to create programs that are specifically devoted to your area as well as areas that are in, have general uh, information that's regarding right. that, that that's your your zones. Let's go help with everything, our tips book and everything. Reversing oh, brood boxes. Yeah. That's a, that's one of those topics that can draw out the swords. I reverse brood boxes. Nice. I don't reverse brood boxes. I'm not willing to change my mind. It's not our goal to get anyone <laughs> to change their mind about reversing brood boxes. The concept of reversing brood boxes is just like it says. We take the top box and put it on the bottom of the hive. And then in turn, we take that bottom box and put it on top of the hive. And we're done now. Yeah. That's it. When the question or the, the statement then would be when needed. When needed. Well, let's go into the when needed part. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, we're done. Y'all can go home. Um, all right. So there's a time and a place for reviews, reversing brood boxes. I've got the well, or is there, listen there to it, play both sides yeah. of the box right here. All right, so I, I really want to throw this out there and want you to think about it clearly. Consistently cold weather under snow, these, these folks are less likely to have to reverse brood boxes for one reason and one reason only. Their bees are consuming less stores. Now, not to say that they won't do it, but most likely it would be a little later on. It wouldn't be as soon as the Southern stakes would, right? But they're gonna consume less stores than these over here on the other side. And you gotta love that uh, picture by uh, Rich Beggs there. I love this picture. So it's a uh, cold one day and warm the next. Who can relate to that? Except that we've been cold and wet all week. That does happen in a lot of areas. As a matter of fact, the, the southern half of the United States. In that instance, you're going to see your bees consume more stores. Right. Yes, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's interesting that you show that picture on the left of two brood boxes and then a honey super on top of it. Oh, and we're talking about reversing boxes. No, but the concept of reversing boxes had nothing to do with the honey super. It doesn't. That's a blank picture from years ago. That's quite all right. <laughs> but if somebody has that question, you still can go into the concept we're talking about with honey supers on top because we're talking about brood. That's right. We Let's move forward. All right. The theory behind it. Most of the winter honey stores are above the brood nest. And we, we should all know that. Above the brood nest, and as they are consumed, what do the bees do? They migrate into the direction of the food, right? They're moving up towards, they're consuming it, and as they go, they're eating it. The result is a colony that has primarily where? They're primarily up top, right. and, and they're perfectly happy. They don't know that they're not happy. <laughs> they don't. The queen may very well be running out of space to lay. Mm -hmm. Um, and she might be twitching a little bit as a result <laughs> of it, but everyone is generally comfortable until the time comes that we start talking about incoming nectar. Well, then, yeah. then we we uh, kind of have to face the concept of are we at jeopardy of swarm? Well, if she's got not room to lay, That's like that third bullet point, if the queen fails to move downward and access the brood nest, then she's not got anywhere to lay. And that's what's going to end up happening is everything's going to be up top. But if she doesn't migrate back down, she's literally going to look like those boxes Blake was showing that are just bursting with bees. And there's just she's just going to go, I don't have anywhere to go. Well, I'm you know, some some queens and some colonies naturally migrate down when they run out of space. They do that in, in hollow trees. They do it in way. Mm -hmm. So it's not unheard of. It's very very logical that yours may very well go down but just in case it doesn't let's let's look into it deeper and see what happens if we try to intervene so i i apparently sherry had a minute on her hands i really didn't but i got so focused on making this depiction for you that i did three of them so this is kind of how it progresses we go into fall go into winter with this big nice big you know, middle of top and bottom boxes and everything's going great. As the season changes, our bees are dying off, which is normal. They're gonna get a smaller population. We're in the dormant stage. It starts to shrink. And then as it gets cold, it's gonna get shrink smaller and smaller. And as they eat through those resources, they just work their way up. 
So I want props for this cute little depiction here. Yeah, I just, props. I think, I mean, it does. So the third picture shows the bees up top. It does. And it shows virtually nothing down below, nothing. except for just empty comb. That's it. That's it. So then I didn't make this this one on the right-hand side. It's a super, super graphic created by uh, Paul Longwell years ago, but I've loved it and I've used it many times. So our goal is just as the name implies, is to move the brood nest to the lowest point of the hive giving free enough the space for the queen to lay. So let's look at this real quick. As the top, the top two boxes, you see that, that the blue being the brood nest has moved to the top. It's still got a little bit of honey cap up there, but it's moved all the way to the top, leaving the bottom completely empty. That's when we can just flip places like James was talking about in a minute ago. But what if you see this? down here on the bottom. This is really gonna require you go in and see. Now we've got some cold days still ahead. So we give this a couple of weeks and most of our hives. But when you go in and look, don't just assume that my bees have moved to the top and there's not anything in the bottom. You want 90% of those bees moved because if you don't, look at this, you're gonna be busting up a brood nest, a nice cluster that looks just like this. This is a Randy Oliver depiction. You know, as the slide shows, they're calmly spanning both boxes, which split in two parts if you reverse. And, and that, that can be devastating to a colony, especially when it's cold. If we were to put a smaller portion of that brood nest up top. Mm -hmm. Takes that football and does it like this, doesn't it? It does. And, that, and that's a good thing, the thermoregulating. Yeah. You've lost that factor. So think that through. And then the second bullet point, if you reverse too early, they're just going to do it over again. So really, you know, time it. You're going to really want to look and see what's going on. Don't assume that you do this because there is a right and a wrong hmm. of reversing bird yeah, boxes. The, the way I like to look at it is, is, is each individual hive has its own characteristics. And if we anticipate that this one might be subject to needing reverse, but we have more brood in one box than we would like before that happens, mm -hmm. then maybe we could wait. If we're not seeing signs of swarming, mm -hmm. if the nectar flows really haven't kicked in hard, she's still got room in that. Where there's still are. room for the yeah. colony to draw in a little bit tighter. We can reverse further down the road. Mm -hmm. We can just make notations in our mind that mm -hmm. this one is subject to it. So we have the ability to say yes. No, mm -hmm. and then maybe, maybe, or maybe at some point in the future. The advantage to doing the reversal is it provides the queen with the opportunities to move up. Mm -hmm. Why do we move up in a Langstroth colony? Why do we want to encourage that? Because that's where we harvest honey from, mm -hmm. and that's where we work our bees from. We perform our hive inspections. If you've ever worked a war, I, while it's a fun way to do it, it requires a lot of lifting, more so than in our, our Langstroth hives. War, well, right, for those that don't know, it's, it's kind of square. It's a different type of, uh, it's it's not Langstrip boxes. Look it up. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Um, so the million dollar question, do I have to? Is it necessary? Um, it's not totally necessary. You do have options. Um, but I think that we've kind of explained that if, if everything's moved up to the top, then if she runs out of space or, or, or what, then you, you know, it's probably a good idea. But it's entirely up to you. We've talked to beekeepers. This is one of those, Ask 10 beekeepers, get however many answers, more than 10, um, whether they do. Some do, some don't. We do. We do reverse brood boxes and we when it's appropriate. When it's appropriate and it works very, very well. You know, and going back to where we started with the conversation here, if, if we follow the concept that we do about uh, so many young beekeepers or newer beekeepers uh, fall into the category of, of bottom box neglect, if you do bottom box neglect coming out of winter and all you look at is the top box, you won't know then you're happens. thinking, wow, I need to split or I need to add a third box or whatever the other options may be. When in reality, you don't know what's recurring below. So you're that right. box then becomes a candidate for doing the box reversal. It gives you the opportunity to manage that colony as necessary, to mm -hmm. feed as necessary and to be able to view the growth as it's occurring. Mm -hmm. He's talking about inspecting your boxes. That's a big deal. Here's another cool picture from Nanette Davis. I love bee pictures. Everybody that knows me knows if you take a good bee picture, send it to Sherry, she'll put it in the magazine. All right, so considerations and actions. Wait it out. James was just kind of talking about that. Monitor your space and food stores closely. 
because really we're doing that. And Blake's talked about that. February coming up is really can be a very nerve wracking time for beekeepers because our food stores are getting light, they're getting lean. They've had all winter. If we're lucky, we hadn't had to feed yet, but be prepared to feed, especially if they're migrating up because what does that mean? It means they've completed the bottom. They have really and truly eaten through their stores in the bottom. It's probably virtually gone. So if you're gonna wait it out, you really do need to be prepared to feed. A common question on, on any type of feeding or any type of action with the colony of bees is when do we do this? Yeah. Well, we have an outside time on this is that bullet number four shows. Mm -hmm. Reversing is done before the nectar flow. That nectar flow, if, I, if I, um, a swarm process is going to begin, then it's going to be the result of the combination flows mm -hmm. of pollen and nectar. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to accomplish True. this task, we want to do it before the, the nectar flow so we can see what's coming in so the bees can react to it properly and we can go into the swarm prevention mode. And mentioning that, it'd be great for any and everyone who doesn't know swarm prevention measures and the signs mm -hmm. to delve into that prior to swarm season. Mm -hmm. um, here we go again. When is swarm <laughs> season? Well, Blake, Blake mentioned up. that it's not likely to be occurring in February, but the end of February is a possibility. March, the middle of March, Seven but definitely five. by your first nectar flow regard, depending upon where you're located. Absolutely. Well, and just to I think we missed bullet point number three, super early. And that doesn't mean super early. It means super early. Think about that because we we really try to super in advance of our nectar flow coming. So you can actually add a box on top of your weighted out hive. If you want to, to wait it out, you can actually put a honey super on top of there just to give them more bee space. Um, the, the queen may migrate a little bit up into that, but you know, be careful with, with going too far with that, but super early anytime. Reversing is done before nectar flow. He covered that very, very well. We want to have this done. Everybody settled in before the nectar flow hits because we everybody needs to be in their positions ready to go. Queen's laying, she's expanding the brood nest and that all needs to be in place before that starts. Swarm preventative is going to come in next month. We're going to talk big time about it in the March yeah, that's issue. Good. And again, um, we have a guest coming we next did. month, which is going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a secret. But uh, really keep an eye on, look at, look at past issues of the, Tex the sorry, DB Supply Monthly magazine. It was called Texas Bee Supply Monthly then. But uh, we, we want to stay on top of our swarm preventative. This really is one of those ways by reviews, reverse and brood boxes. And you know, this, this conversation is very much like, do I treat for varroa or, or not? Mm. And then uh, do I treat everything or just the ones that need it? There's always an answer as long as you've thought it through. So think through each and every hive and don't just make one decision. Don't go out and say, we're going to go reverse 20 boxes today because only sense. eight of them may need it. As an R2. Now, so now we can say it. back to you, Blake. Back to you, Blake. <laughs> we even had time left over. I knew we were going to go long through your program. Wow. That is super impressive. I, I really don't think that I know what to do with, with extra time. I don't I don't think that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can some questions. We can um, yeah. Well, let me uh share my screen back here. Um uh, yes, that's the right one. Um, yeah, great, great questions, everybody. It's so much fun to answer the questions. I mean, it's such a, such a sharp crowd that, and they ask such good questions. So, so well, thanks for please, that. Let me jump in and say something. Yeah, so please. as we're going into, um, February is happening quick. We're here. What on the, what's today? The second or the third? To the second. Today's the second. It seems like it's already a week past because I'm already in March mode. But we're going to be middle of February before we know it, folks. And our bees truly do need our attention. They need to most of the southern part of the United States. These bees will have consumed a majority of their resources. 20 pounds stored minimum. I would even be, I'd even be feeding if I had 20 pounds stored. How about you, Blake? Yes. Yeah. I agree with you guys. Yeah. I mean, we're going into, I've seen, I see more bees starve to death in February and March than yep. in December. You know, I think we think in the winter they're eating all this food, but they're really clustered tightly and they don't eat that much food over the winter. It's really, 
leading into winter and coming out of winter that they can burn through those stores incredibly quickly as that hive is building up brood. So true, because that's what's happening. She's she's building. I mean, even and right. I've had interviews with some um, folks that are in, in northern states. And even though the bees are in there in the cold regions, she's still ramping up laying. Um, even right. if it's cold outside, they know right. they're going by that earth shift, not necessarily the temperature outside. Right. Exactly. Totally agree. Um, one other thing I did want to mention is uh, several people asked in the comments um, about how you reverse boxes with two deeps versus a deep and a medium. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I just want to mention that it's the exact same way. And so if you've got two deep boxes or a deep and a medium, all the principles apply either way. I mean, if you've got a deep and a medium, medium goes on the bottom and then the bees will move up. And then a month later, you can often swap it right back so that, you know, once all the bees move up into that deep box, uh, then you can swap it back and put the medium back up on top. So same principles. Same principle. And the reason I'm glad you said that. And the reason that you can swap it back is because as it warms up, bees are spread out. There's no cluster involved. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, totally. There's actually, some people that medium bottom, um, that put mediums on the bottoms and they leave right. it like that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But that, that was a good question, and we neglected to, to say that there. We do have some Q&A. Let me see. Yeah, so we've got we've got five minutes, so let's just answer some of these questions live in the five minutes that we've got. I've always wanted to do live Q&A. Um, <laughs> uh, Justin uh, said, can you split your hive and be able to make a honey crop? Um, mm -hmm. Should I focus on splitting or building my apiary first? That's a really good question, and it – like a lot of things in beekeeping, it depends. You know, obviously the stronger you make your splits or not splitting is going to yield more honey. Uh, but if you want to do both, then the key is to split as early as possible. So as early as you can possibly get queens, you want to make those splits and you want to use mated queens and you want to give those splits, you know, four to five frames of brood per split. And so if you do that, if you get mated queens, you know, you're splitting four to six weeks before the honey flow starts and uh, and you're giving them four to five frames of brood, you should still make a great honey crop, even though you made a split. Absolutely. And also go to page 56 in the February issue of the magazine that just came out. And it says, can my splits be honey producers this year? Um, well, there you go. Yeah, there you go. It's right there. It's, just, it's, it's a very short read. It's one side of one page. So check that out because it really and yeah. truly, it can be done. It can be right. done. It's a bigger split. Well, it's, really. very, yeah. it's very helpful in that the key numbers of like, like I told us were the four to six weeks mm -hmm. prior to your major nectar flow. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the critical point for us as beekeepers is to know when our primary nectar flow is mm -hmm. and then work accordingly. If we don't know what the flow is, then we don't know when it starts. Um, and we're not talking about minor flows. So you need to fully explore what is in your area that is the big hit, the one that really happens. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we need to be prepared for if we want to harvest sunny. So that four to six weeks gives our colonies time to recover from what we did, yeah. to build populations, populations large enough to actually uh, harvest the honey, harvest in. the nectar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love that. Uh, yeah, great point, James. Uh, Jennifer said, "Can I freeze the sugar bricks that I didn't use?" Um, yeah, they shouldn't. They should freeze just fine. So if you've got leftover sugar bricks, you can freeze them. They might be a little on the crumbly, mushy side when you get them out, but the bees don't care. I mean, the, the more crumbly and mushy the sugar bricks are, that just means they get to eat them that much. It's that much easier for them to eat. So the bees certainly don't care. Uh, so yeah, I, I would I would feel fine with that. Um, somebody asked a really good question. Um, um, a lot of good points are discussed, but where I am, it's cold and wet and I can't open the boxes up. How do I check on my bees? How do you do that, James and Sherry? Well, you know, we we, we like to say that we never go into our colonies unless we have a reason. That's... So first, first, is there a reason to check on your bees? Are you concerned that you may not have honey storage? Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about the population? Mm -hmm. Whatever that concern may be, if you feel like it's important enough to address it, then never put off something that you can do. Your bees are not going to be harmed by a quick look inside a box. 
We've, it's we've, very comfortable to, to do so. Blake is doing that right now. Yeah. Uh, the bees that they're they're working in uh, on the almonds, it's cold, <laughs> but they still have to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you leave the box open for as short a period as often as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it may even be that you don't have to look down into that second box. You can tell what you want to tell by the top, but you can weigh your hives with your hive tool if you're concerned about, about uh, honey mm -hmm. stores. But there's lots of things you can do to address it. But if you have a reason, then go forward. The, the bees will not lose all their heat for one quick opening and looking in. And if you're in our neck of the woods, just wait a minute, the weather will change. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I love that. And I think Lawana asked in the, in the chat, you know, how do you estimate food stores? And if it is too cold, you can't always just lift up on the hive a little bit, you know, and just guess, you know, you can kind of lift up and get a feel for, oh, this seems super light or, oh, this has a lot of weight to it. And I think you even have, you guys even have a YouTube video on our YouTube channel about lifting up to, to uh, estimate food stores. So um, that's a, that's a method to do uh, as well. So um, let's see. Uh, uh, Jim asked, how many people are using Jamie Ellis's hive setup of one deep plus a queen excluder plus a medium box? I've talked with Jamie a couple of times, and it sounds like a great way to simplify dealing with double deep plus ease of management. Um, I kept bees for 35 years, and it sounds like a great alternative. So um, so what do you guys think about using a deep and a medium uh, rather than double deep? Um, or well, maybe I'm even saying, a deep and a deep and a queen excluder and a medium. So it's really running singles, uh, it is single deep. Well, James wrote an excellent article on it. And I'm trying to remember somebody else. I told him to email me and I would tell him which issue. But go back in our archives. I believe that it was um, sometime in 2021, the end of 2021, October-ish, that he wrote um, running single deeps. And that's how you do it. You literally have a single deep hive that you have to use the queen excluder. Your top medium super is just that. It is a honey super, but the space allows for population. It's not that the queen's laying up there, but sometimes the bees do swarm mode because they just don't have elbow room. And that medium super will make, that's right. They got to have elbow room. It, that gives them room to expand their cells, their body of, of the population and prevents that swarm instinct because they actually do have that room up there. Um, it's a great article. Yeah. I, and, sometimes you, I, oh, sometimes you have to take the step of, uh, of tampering the population a little bit. Maybe you need to People move some, it. Yeah, maybe you need to move some bees out of it mm -hmm. uh, at certain times of year. But one thing I, that I firmly believe and that what applies in humans also applies in bees in this case, and that there's power in numbers. Mm -hmm. If you have a colony that you're having trouble controlling the temperament of the colony, mm -hmm. try pulling them down to a single deep, eliminating some of that population. Like and I think you'll find in a lot of cases that the bees are much easier to work okay. and your beekeeping gets a little happier. We teach the double deep because that seems to be the most efficient but it doesn't work for everybody as the most efficient. I love yeah. the single deep. Yeah. And then using, using an add-on super of whatever size you want as the temporary buffer mm -hmm. to allow the population to expand and then contract when you want mm -hmm. it to contract. I know of a beekeeper yeah. names that runs over 100 hives doing it in single deeps with that, that honey super all year long. All year yeah, long. I mean, yeah. And there's even commercial beekeepers that run singles with no second box at all. Um, and it's just a single deep and, and, you know, all throughout the winter uh, and early spring, it's still just a single and they don't add another box until they're ready to make honey. Um, Jim also asked, you know, what are the, what are the negatives? And I'd say the, the biggest negative is that you've got to almost all management, you've got to be more prompt on. So mm -hmm. swarm management, feeding, uh, all those things, you've got to be incredibly prompt because if you're a week late you know, adding another box when they need it, they're going to swarm because that's such a small amount of space or they can starve to death a whole lot faster because they don't have as much room to store food. Um, you know, that queen excluder, you're going to have to pull that off going into winter because you want, if the bees move up to access that honey, the queen needs to be able to move up there with them. Uh, you know, in Florida where Jamie is, that works a little better. You can't, you can get away with leaving a queen excluder on year round because it's, it's warm. Uh, you know, in 
anywhere but Florida, you know, you've got to pull that queen excluder off for the winter um, so that so that the queen can move up with the cluster. So there are some downsides. There are also pros. Um, and so, yeah, I would go back to uh, that article that Sherry is referencing and, and definitely check it out because there's there's a lot of interesting pros and cons. Jim, so, uh, Jim, Jim, I don't know Jim's last name, but he just helped me out. And you are right, Jim. It is in the um, April 2022 issue, Managing Single Story Hives on page 24. Go. Thanks. Wow. Well, hey, there you go. Fantastic. Um, guys, it is, uh, we're a couple minutes over and yeah. we try to end promptly. Uh, but it's so much fun to do live Q and A. We've got to we've got to factor this in in the future. Share, remind me, and we'll we'll, we'll try to leave some time for live Q and A because it's it's a lot of fun. If you did put Q and A questions in the Q and A box and we didn't get to them, um, we'll hang out and keep answering those uh, um, off off the air. So, uh, but guys, oh, yeah. yeah, it yeah. might be it might be in some someone's mind since we talk so much about uh, almonds. How long will your bees be on the almonds? Yeah, our bees will be on the almonds until mid-March. And so usually somewhere around the 15th of March, the blooms really start wrapping up. And uh, and then it's back home and we'll be splitting bees uh, 24 hours a day uh, till mid-April. So, yeah, so they'll, they'll be out here a minute right. longer. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Thank you, James and Sherry. Thank you for everybody attending tonight. And uh, we will see all of you in March. Have a great February. See you.